Thanks, Patricia. I'm very happy to introduce Rita Fried to you. She's a dear friend. Um, let me get, a, get out of the way first the boring academic stuff. Rita got her undergraduate degree at Wellesley, and her PhD is from the NYU Institute of Fine Art, of Arts, right? Um, but now about her career, which is much more interesting. I first met Rita in 1986. She was here in New York to give a talk. At that time, she was director of the Institute for Egyptian Art and Archaeology at Memphis. And she was giving a talk about an exhibition that she was mounting on Ramses the Great, which is now one of those famous exhibitions. And her talk was about how she was bringing this colossal statue of Ramses from Memphis, Egypt, to Memphis, Tennessee. Right? And it was a remarkable talk about, you know, somehow she had charmed the Egyptian Antiquities Organization and to let her, let her bring this, this statue over, but she had to restore it first. So she had slides of the restoration of it and how she was going to be transporting and all this. And it was an amazing talk. And, and my wife, Pat, leans o over next to me and whispers, we have to get to know this woman. Right? And we did. And, and for many years, for the four of us, Peter, her husband, Pat, we and I have had great adventures together. Now, Rita's career is, is a remarkable one. Um, when she mounted this exhibit, it was in, in, in Memphis, it was a smash. I mean, it was spectacular. And it, and it just really made the city come alive. They, later, in 1994, they built the Memphis Pyramid. You know they have a sports arena that's in the shape of a pyramid. And they never would have built that arena without Rita's exhibition, <laughs> which really made you know, and. and when, when Rita left Memphis for Boston, for the Museum of Fine Arts, Memphis never recovered. They never had things like that again. They didn't. Now, Rita presently is, is, is the chair of the Department of Ancient World Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And while she's been there for many years, she's been mounting these ex exhibits. Her, her modus operandi is to have a fabulous exhibit and then a wonderful catalog. And she's had a, a load of those. Um, I want to show you a couple. Just let me show you. This is Rita's baby catalog. In 1982, when she was young in the field, she started with this one, Egypt's Golden Age. And it's still used by all of us today. It's a wonderful catalog. It's, it's a really wonderful thing. Um, now, if you want the full story of Rita's moving the statue to Memphis, it's this catalog you have to get. The one on Ramses the Great. Right? That's another good one. Now, one more I'll show you. Just I, I didn't bring them all. Um, <laughs> The last one, in case you've missed one of her last ones, right, it's Secrets of Tomb 10A, which is about that wonderful tomb of Jehudi Nacht at Bersha, which is, and, and Rita was also the co-director of the epigraphic survey at, at Bersha. So Rita does both art history, epigraphic survey, she does it all. Um, but I don't want to take any time from her talk, so let me introduce my dear friend, Rita Fried. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. It's always nice to be back here. It's, I'm looking at a room full of friends, and it, it doesn't get any better than that. I have a theory that Bostonians come to New York more than New Yorkers come to Boston. I don't understand it, but I hope you all are not strangers to the Museum of Fine Arts, founded, by the way, the same year as the Met was founded. So, uh, and uh, knowing this audience, I know that you all know that we have a spectacular Egyptian collection in Boston, just as you have here at the Met. We have about 70,000 objects. Uh, thanks largely to 40 years of archaeological excavation, 23 different sites in Egypt and Sudan. Uh, our, uh, our, the stars, who you all know so well, George Reisner, unmistakable, but also a very uh, young and dapper Dows Dunham, who I first met as an undergraduate student, and uh, he uh, frightened me then, <laughs> just as this looks frightening. Well, thanks to very generous divisions from those 40 years of excavations, we have the collection we do. So you may know a number of our pieces, for example, and I can't resist showing you some of my favorites. Uh, so every period is well represented. A pre-dynastic Egypt in this beautiful plate from the Said which, with what I think is one of the world's earliest landscapes with the, the Nile in the middle, these hippos trotting around, and of course the mountains. Uh, of course, you all know Menkaua and his queen uh, from the Menkaua Valley Temple. 
a personal favorite because you just can't not like it, uh, the famous Bersha coffin with amazing details, uh, painterly details, including uh, in this dove, I think uh, an artist absolutely showing off because that bird, if you look closely, and I can't resist this, has three wings. It has one wing that's down, one wing that's up that you see from the underside here, and one wing that's up that you see from the top top side, so three wings. But you know, you have to look carefully to notice it. Uh, so, uh, and I'll continue from the New Kingdom, uh, a, a god uh, masquerading as with the features of Amenhotep III, quite a, uh, a space AG piece. Uh, of course, the Boston Greenhead. I, I remember seeing it for the first time and I was totally stunned that it was the size of my fist. So I, of course, would love to see you all uh, in Boston uh, uh, enjoying these pieces. These are not the pieces that I'm talking about tonight, however. You may ask, with these 70,000 objects, why we're still collecting. Well, I think every institution has gaps, and we all aim to fill those gaps. But we, we aim to show also that it is possible to collect responsibly. And uh, it is possible to make significant additions to the collection. So a word about collecting. I know provenance has been a big factor recently. I know a number of you have even worked in that area of provenance, of antiquities provenance. We, and I'm sure every other reputable museum, adhered strictly to the guidelines of the AAMD, the American Association of Museum Directors. Uh, what they say is that every acquisition should be clearly documentable until at least 1970, back at least to 1970. Uh, and that's, of course, in accordance with the UNESCO treaty of that date. I, and by, let me just say, by clearly documentable, I don't mean said to be from a Swiss private collection. <laughs> we check everything, including import and export documentation. So do we enjoy doing this? Absolutely not. Do we understand why we're doing it? Yes. And I, I, this is not the my topic, but uh, sometimes we spend more time on the paperwork than we do researching the object. So um, with that by way of introduction, what I'm going to do tonight is present to you three pieces that we've acquired in the last three years or so, which I think make significant additions to the collection. And uh, moreover, I, I put them together because they were all incorrectly identified by one source or another and really, I think, deserve more attention than they might have gotten in the past. So uh, let me start. Uh, this, of course, means we acquired in 2011 our 1898th piece was this one. I was at, an, I was at Masterpiece Art Fair in London heading uh, for an appointment, and I stopped absolutely dead in my tracks because this piece caught my eye. It was in a dealer I didn't know, but I went, uh, and nevertheless, uh, went immediately over to it in the back of his stand, said, I want that piece. Could you save it for me? I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and that is exactly what happened. He very kindly, uh, we did meet the, the next day. I, it, I looked at it. I looked at the label. The label beside it said, it, uh, an Egyptian granite head of a king, dynasty 30, probably Nectanebo the first. Now, you may wonder why I was interested in this piece. Uh, it's uninscribed. It's a little beat up. Uh, and why would Boston want this? Uh, well, thanks to my training down the street at the Institute of Fine Arts and years of museum work, I knew this was no 30th Dynasty piece. The dealer had simply copied the auction catalog uh, entry for it. Uh, he had purchased it at auction in 2010, the year before. It had been consigned by the family of a, co of a collector who had purchased it at Gallery Moderne in Brussels in 1967, so the provenance was all right. Uh, the even more amazing thing is when the dealer purchased it, it looked like this. 
now, quite frankly, I don't blame either the dealer or auction house for identifying it as Dynasty 30, because quite frankly, from this, I wouldn't have a clue what uh, it was. The dealer, to his great credit, removed the restoration, and this became this. So, what are we looking at? Or, I should say, who are we looking at? Well, here's some other views. Uh, we're looking at a life-size granodiorite head. Uh, obviously a king, because he's wearing a nemesis. Uh, rather large eyes, slightly close together. A very broad nose. From what's left of the nose, you can see just how broad those nostrils are. Decided folds of flesh right here above the nostrils. Thick, straight lips and a chin that's set off. And from this three-quarter view, you can see that there's a lot of area in this cheek here that's just simply plain, smooth, and unmodeled. Moreover, the, the massiveness of the face is what really, uh, to me, was so distinctive. Now, when I think of 30th Dynasty, I think of Brooklyn's Weatherware, I think of our head probably neck to Nabo the second, and I think of this very sweet, almost effeminate look, these very mannered lines, sharp lines. I, when I see this, I see a, a, almost a brutality that is completely absent in something like this. This sheer um, mass of head bears no relation, to my eye at least, to to those 30th Dynasty pieces. On the other hand, this vast bulk of the face is not unlike the heads of Mentuhotep II, and this is a piece from across the street at the Met, the head of the, the big uh, sandstone Osiride. I'm not saying they're the same, but what I am saying is that this same uh, bulk uh, is, uh, is obvious here. Uh, you have the broad nose, the folds at the side of the nostrils, and broad lips. I, now, this is a little uh, less sophisticated than this. I, I, I do see a lot of differences, so let's, let's move on. And we're, we're moving on to uh, Mentuhotep III right here. This happens to be the only unrecarved statue of Mentuhotep III. It, it's, in the, it's in the Luxor Museum right now uh, from Armand, and of course, this is our piece. So here you see a step toward a greater integration of the features into the face, more sophisticated modeling. But still, this, uh, this and this are two, two different worlds. So uh, moving up yet farther to the first king of the 12th dynasty, Amenemhat I, these are the two, uh, two dated statues, the only two dated statues of that king. This, a life-size granite statue from Fakus in the Delta. This, an over-life-size uh, colossal statue uh, from t found at Tanis, and both now in the Cairo Museum. This actually is a well-traveled statue. It's been to Port Said. Last I saw it, it was in the Cairo Museum. I can't vouch for where it is now. But what I do see are the, is the same bulk of the face here that I see in the Boston head. And if I look at the, the eyes, um, relatively close together, slightly modeled, very broad nostrils, decided um, pinches of flesh right here, uh, same fleshy lips, uh, modeled, not just uh, plain, and that very firm chin, ball chin set off here. So uh, there I. Uh, there are many things to compare there. I, there are other things to look at. If you look at the top of the head of the Boston piece, you'll notice not only is the head of the uraeus knocked off, but there was a very decided effort, and I can even see the tool marks, to, to remove all the coils of the snake of that, the, that formed the body of the uraeus. And uh, then that was done across the top of the head. It, the, the, it then forms a tail that merges neatly with one of the raised release, uh, relief pleats of the nemesis. Now, 
Fortunately, they didn't do such a good job that we can't see what was once there. And having looked at this carefully uh, with colleagues, I count that there were loops across the top of the head. And you, here you can see the remains. If I count each bend as a loop, I get between 11 and 13 loops here. Now, why am I talking to you about things that are chiseled away? Well, this is the top of the head from Fakus, of the, the seated uh, life-size Amenemhat I. And if you look here, you see also that tightly, the tightly coiled body of the uraeus uh, uh, that finally straightens out abruptly into a tail that merges with the pleat at about halfway down the head. So it turns out that this is, uh, by the reign of the next king, there are many fewer loops. Just a, a view of the backs of the heads, you see here that it's about the same distance down the head. The, the, the photographs are at slightly different angles. So, uh, and no other king really has this number of loops. So. I would say that the combination of the stylistic similarities with the Amenemhat I and this very simple diagnostic of these tightly coiled uh, uraeus loops, or loops of the body of the snake, for me, are convincing that this is ahead of Amenemhat I. And for us, it joins what we have. This is a, a, a statue of Mentuhotep III from Armand, like the Luxor Museum uh, Colossus, or a uh, statue rather, except that this face, as well as the inscription, has been recarved. So this is 11th Dynasty plus. Uh, this is our famous Lady Senui life-size statue of a woman from the reign of Sinwaswit I, the king who follows Amenemhat I. So here uh, it does fill a gap for us and gives us a nice progression and greatly strengthens our Middle Kingdom collection. So uh, that, was, uh, that was a very nice find for us. The next piece I would like to talk about came in 2012 and it is a torso without a head. So uh, it, um, it's life-size, handsome, uh, a body part of granodiorite. It was first published in uh, the Sotheby London catalog in 1962. And in 1962, it was identified as the torso of an 18th dynasty scribe. Here, 18th dynasty, 15th century BC. Fast forward 17 years when it was sold at auction in, in Paris, but then it was dated to the 13th century AD. <laughs> 28 centuries of difference. And it was, it was said to have come from Rajasthan, India. <laughs> so we ultimately bought it from a dealer uh, with uh, what I believe is the correct date and attribution. So what do we have here? We indeed have uh, the torso of a scribe, identifiable readily by his scribal kit, which you see both on the front and on the back, uh, and uh, also his pose, uh, his seated pose, uh, indicates that he, uh, he is a scribe. If you look at, it, at him carefully, you will notice there's slightly more space here, in slightly more of this negative space on, on his proper right side than it, there is on his left. And what that tells me is that his right arm was angled out slightly more than his left and probably held a writing implement whereas his left ang would have anchored on his lap a roll of papyrus. So uh, that's uh, what you would have seen in the missing part. You, of course, do see the beginnings of the lap. Also noteworthy, a uh, very large tab here, upright vertical tab. And I hope you can make out this uh, somewhat odd-looking uh, herringbone pattern right above the waist here. You will also notice that it's, the surface is decidedly rough, I, and that is a dead giveaway that it's an unfinished piece. It was never finished. And also the fact that the ink cakes haven't been hollowed out also suggests that it's unfinished. Uh, it is hard, however, not to notice that it is headless. Uh, and uh, the break was a, a smooth cut here, 
And right in the center of the neck break, there's a, a concave, a smooth concave depression. Of course, what that tells me is that the, the head was once replaced. When you think about it, there are really very few torsos, either royal or private, that are identifiable on the basis of the body, that body part alone. A head, yes. And the, so this is really one of those very few, uh, particularly uninscribed statues, royal or private, that we can identify, I, as I hope to show you. Uh, moreover, as I hope to show, what is missing and how it is missing is as important as what is present. So I, uh, as we've discussed, um, based on his pose and his scribal kit, it's clear it was a scribe. Uh, now, the scribal pose we get first at the time uh, in the fourth dynasty, time of Menkau Ra. Uh, this is, if not the earliest, then one of the earliest scribal statues uh, uh, in the form of uh, Kuen Ra, uh, Menkau Ra's son. You will notice a couple of significant differences. One, he has no scribal kit. Old Kingdom scribes don't have scribal kits. And also, he's, very, he's really quite slim. I, you don't get fat scribes, at least in sculpture in the round in the Old Kingdom. So those innovations begin only in Dynasty 12. The earliest datable examples we have from Dynasty 12 I, are represented by statue of, of a man who, uh, is, whose name is mentioned, Hotep, who was named vizier, uh, that is the second only in, in importance to the king. And he lived uh, during the reign of Sinwasrit I, uh, and he was named vizier toward the end of his reign. We know that he was an important individual uh, because he commissioned more statues of himself than any other private individual with the exception of Senmut. So, how many life-size statues are we talking about? There are over 10 uh, statues or statue fragments uh, from his very large Mastabit list, and they're being published by Dorothea Arnold. In addition to the Lish statues, there are at least eight, and as many as 10 from Karnak, including the statue now in Cairo, as well as the, uh, this one, uh, I believe, uh, this one's in the Louvre, and this one in the Luxor Museum. This is the Cairo statue again. Uh, you see the same pose there. These are all uh, granodiorite. And also these three, this in one in Cairo, these two in the Louvre, in a slightly different but nevertheless scribal pose. Uh, some of these are in sandstone. So what is interesting that all but six of these now, as many as 20 statues from Lisht, show Mentu Hotep in one of uh, either this scribal pose or the, the uh, cross-legged scribal pose. So the, the pose he is effectively shown in, in all the statues where we can tell are scribal statues. And again, no other individual in Egyptian history commissioned more statues of himself as a scribe. This is, of course, a pose denoting intelligence, respect, authority. And what's also interesting, all of those statues, with one exception, the one you see here at the Louvre, are now headless. So it seems very logical uh, to compare uh, those statues of Mentuhotep uh, to the statue, uh, or the torso, I should say, now in Boston. Uh, these two, by the way, in the Luxor Museum were found west of the first pylon. This one in the Cairo Museum was uh, found in the cachette. And the Louvre statues are not, uh, came in the 18th century without a specific provenance. Now, in addition to all being life-size and granodiorite in this case, you'll see all of them have the scribe, well, all with the exception of this one, have the scribal kit. All have those wonderful naturalistic folds of flesh and the pendant breasts. I, and as I said, all are life-size. They also have uh, the, uh, the waist-high garment with this very large tab, 
And if you look carefully, particularly at this one, you'll see a very unusual, very elaborate knot here. And here also, I uh, can't see it too well on the others. So in short, there are many shared attributes. I, I did um, mention that uh, they're all except one are headless. But what is further interesting is that the two statues in the Luxor Museum and the Boston Head all have reworkings in the area where the head is. So the slots in the Luxor Museum statues and this depression here. And of course, what that says uh, is that the head must have been replaced in antiquity. So in short, between the Boston statue and Menju Hotep, many shared attributes. Uh, the size, the pose, the material, uh, the naturalistic flat folds, the garment with its complex tab, and so forth. Well, does that mean uh, that the, the Boston statue is, in fact, another representation of Menju Hotep? Maybe there are other possibilities. This uh, is the Mentu Hotep in Cairo that we looked at. This is a statue of a man named Teti Emre, uh, also in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. You see those same naturalistic fl flesh folds and the, the strange double knot here, that vertical tab. But he's not Mentu Hotep, he's Teti Emre, or at least that's the name that's written on him. However, both Vandier and later Gary Scott, the scholar who's now director of RC, who wrote a four volume uh, work on scribal statues, all believe that this was re that this statue was reinscribed. And if you think about it, it would be highly unusual for a Middle Kingdom statue to have an inscription on the vertical side of the base like this. So I am choosing uh, to agree with Vandier and Gary Scott that this is, I've not examined it in person, but I do believe that the Teti Emre inscription is a later inscription. And this too, uh, most likely based on the tremendous similarities in modeling and so forth, uh, this too was probably once meant to Hotep. But let's look farther because certainly scribal statues appear later on in the, in the Middle Kingdom and certainly into the New Kingdom, as for example, this beautiful statue of Hormheb across the street. What happens in the later 12th Dynasty and also in the New Kingdom is that scribal statues tend to have much longer wigs, as you see here. And also in the 18th Dynasty, uh, they are, are likely to have inscriptions on their torsos something that really doesn't happen on uh, Middle Kingdom statues. So uh, going on beyond the New Kingdom, in the late period, scribal statues do occur, but they're rare. None of them look like the Boston torso. So based on this quick review, I would like to suggest that the Boston torso is yet another representation of Mentuhotep, the vizier. Most likely it comes from Karnak. And since one of the many titles he bore was overseer of all works of the king, it's not out of the question that he was the one who was responsible for the building of St. Walsrup I's Amun Temple at Karnak, from which these two pillars in Cairo and this Osiride statue now in Luxor are the, the fragments we have left. So I. Given that uh, Mentuhotep was likely in charge of this work as, as overseer of all works of the king, we might imagine that that uh, Sinwasrup the first precinct at Karnak, which you see here in Gabold's reconstruction, would have had these statues of Mentuhotep lined up outside where he could either or both take part in the rituals that Sinwasrup the first took part in, and also in a way serve as intermediaries between the people and the god inside the temple. So this is a uh, very hypothetical reconstruction. So we, these are just some of the now uh, more than 10 statues of him. One more thing. I mentioned his statuary at Licht, where he had a very large tomb located very prominently next to the tomb of Sinwasrit I, or the cenotaph of Sinwasrit I, no, I'm sorry, the, the tomb of Sinwasrit I. Um, 
Mentuhotep, not surprisingly, is also attested at Abydos. Now, at Abydos, already in the Middle Kingdom, there were a whole line of private chapels leading up to the, great, the temple of the great god Osiris. Mentuhotep's chapel would have been the largest, and it would have dominated the landscape. And that's based on this stela. Uh, this is one stela. This is the obverse and reverse of the same piece. The height of this piece, now in Cairo, is 1.81 meters. So that makes it about six feet tall. It's tall, a foot taller than I am. <laughs> now, in Boston is this false door of a vizier and to Hotep. This formed the west wall of that chapel, and it was purchased and published by Kelly Simpson in, in the 80s. And I can't resist drawing your attention to one detail on this false door, which shows, true to form, he is very proud of his abundant size. I would like to suggest to you that this is a representation of the vizier Mentuhotep, uh, despite the fact that it's headless and uninscribed. Now, I've shown you a head and I've shown you a torso, uh, and I know that you expect me to show you feet right now, uh, but I am not going to do that. Uh, in fact, I am going to show you another head. Uh, that is our most recent uh, piece, both in terms of the date of acquisition, which is last year, and in terms of its date. With the Middle Kingdom head and the torso just discussed, the incorrect attribution comes from an auction house or a dealer. However, in the case of the present head, a date that I believe was incorrect was assigned to it by a reputable Egyptologist. But let me start at the beginning. I saw this head also at the Fine Art Fair in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And interestingly enough, I didn't see it in a traditional dealer of antiquities, but rather I saw it in the stand of a decorator. Now, he's not just any decorator. This is, it was Axel Vervoet. I don't think he would mind me mentioning this. He is known for, uh, for his spectacular taste and his reconstruction of the most dramatic interiors using oceanic art, African art, ancient art, Renaissance art. Uh, they're just magnificent. And if you had enough money, you might hire him to integrate your fine and diverse collection in your living room. So in view of that, it really wasn't all that surprising to find this head at the back of his stand. And here the label informed me that it was time that it was from the time of Amenhotep II of the 18th dynasty. I went over to the man who was in charge of the antiquities, and I asked him, in fact, if he was sure of the date. Uh, and his answer was, it has to be. It was published that way. <laughs> and he handed me a three-page catalog entry written by the Egyptologist I referred to earlier. He also showed me a copy of the Lady Mew collection catalog where this head was, was featured. That catalog was published by Budge in 1896. And incidentally, Budge dated it to the 20th dynasty. So with confidence in the 1896 provenance, at least, I was able to purchase it for Boston. So again, uh, what are we looking at? We are looking at another uh, life-size uh, head of granodiorite. Uh, it's hard to miss this horizontal ledge here that, of course, immediately tells me it's from a block statue, also called a cuboid statue or a sit sitting statue, I believe. He wears a shoulder-length striated wig and also has uh, very large eyes in this case, uh, prominent eyebrows that start out straight and then dip at the side, running parallel to the prominent cosmetic lines. Uh, we also see here this prominent pinch of flesh, broad nose, very wide lips, straight, serious, uh, a, a chin clearly set off from, from the lips and the beginnings of a beard. Now, unusually, on the back, we see an inscription. I, I'm sorry, it, it's, I don't mean it, unusually for the pieces I've just discussed. It's very common for block statues, of course, to have inscriptions. 
But what is interesting is the inscriptions here. And this is the beginning of the famous city god formula. I, and here, en chet i en, I translated after me, not. It doesn't much mean much. I, on the proper right of the statue, uh, you see two horizontal rows of inscription, the beginnings of them. It's likely there were many more, and it's likely they wrapped around the front. Here it says D S Jed. Uh, may she give stability. One more thing that I don't want to ignore. There, there is the beginnings of a cartouche, or I should say the remains of a cartouche up here. Here's a close-up of it. What looks like a part of the damage is most likely the beginnings of a, of, of a Ra sign, a circle for Ra. Uh, and it's only from touching it and realizing that that surface is smooth, whereas the rest of the break is quite uh, rough, that I'm, I am convinced it's a Ra sign. That, of course, does me absolutely no good because the prenomena of more than half the kings of ancient Egypt uh, have a raw component at the beginning. So that is, is really not uh, a lot of help. So how are we going to put this all together? From my description of the first piece with the massive head, you would be forgiven if you automatically called to mind this Colossus from Tanis that I showed you earlier. It certainly shares the massive head. It certainly shares these pinches of flesh uh, at the side of the nostrils, the serious mouth, the chin set apart. However, you would be forgiven if you were just looking at the highly arched eyes here, uh, you would be forgiven for thinking that this is a lot like the 18th dynasty. The large eyes, with the, particularly the upper lid, with their high arch and the arched brows. So that is, of course, the Amenhotep II from the Kimball. Uh, and I believe it's on that basis that it was initially dated uh, to the uh, 18th dynasty, to the time of Amenhotep II. So I, what I see, however, in the Amenhotep II are these very smooth, round cheeks, totally devoid of modeling, and a mouth that's actually drawn up in an ever so slight hint of a smile. I don't see that at all here. I see very mottled cheeks, and I see a decidedly straight, not quite frowning, but decidedly straight lips. So when in Egyptian history do we have these two seemingly disparate styles? When do you see a merger of the delicacy of the eye area with the brute strength of the rest of it? And the only answer that I know of is the late period. So here I want to quote Anne Russman. Uh, by the late period, I mean Dynasty 25 to early Dynasty 26. And here I want to quote Anne Russman in her, her wonderful chapter on late period sculpture that you can find in Blackwell's Companion to Ancient Egypt. And I quote, Egyptian sculpture in the third intermediate period and the late period continued many of the artistic traditions developed during earlier periods. Since the persistence of styles from the recent past was frequently an important factor in ancient Egyptian art, it's not surprising to find a strong new kingdom element in the sculpture of the third intermediate period. That tendency continued during the 25th and 26th dynasties, but the archaizing imitation of more distant periods became increasingly important. Never had Egyptian sculptors mined their past so thoroughly as they did during the late period. So with that in mind, let's explore whether our head could be 25th or possibly early 26th dynasty. First, are there block statues at that time? Well, as it turns out, block statues together with uh, kneeling statues are the most popular forms of temple statuary in the late period. For Dynasty 25 alone, Bernard Bothmer, in his article in the Leclant Feshrift, identified 10 dated examples of 25th Dynasty block statues. 
And to those, he added an additional 20 that he considered datable or attributable to the 25th dynasty on the basis of their inscriptions or archaeological contexts. So it is clear that there are many 25th dynasty block statues. Jack Josephson, in his Catalogue Generale volume on statues of the 25th and 26th dynasty, uh, detailed the characteristics of 25th dynasty sculpture, including, and I quote, heavy features, noses nearly as broad as mouths, uh, Cushite folds, which he uh, defined as these pinches of flesh at the nostrils, which we've seen begin in the New Kingdom. With that in mind, Let's look at some dated examples of 25th Dynasty block statues. This is uh, from the Louvre, a block statue of the major domo of Thebes named Harwa. And the cartouches of Amenirdis, one of the, uh, the first Nubian uh, god's wife of Amun, is uh, shown here on, the, on his chest, I guess. But looking here, we certainly see that broad, round face. Well, actually, let me go one further and compare him. You see a similar broad face. You see the Cushite folds. You see the same pattern of the raised relief eyebrows, the large, almost slightly tilted eyes, broad nostrils, uh, modeled but serious mouth and the, the chin set apart. Also, while Harwa's wig is not striated, the, the wigs are approximately the same uh, shape. There's another block statue of Harwa in Berlin, uh, uh, also dated to Amenirdis, and you see the similar attributes there. And here is a comparison uh, to the Boston statue, you definitely see that serious mouth here, and also these very straight brows. There's very little distance between the bottom of the wig and the, the brows here, and you see that same kind of thing there. So also, uh, definitely the lips and nostrils uh, are, are, are of equal width. So uh, that's certainly not the only possibilities. There are two block statues of Ahamenru in Cairo. You see them both here. Uh, also a high steward of the divine wives of Amun, but in his case, uh, slightly later, of Shep and Wepet II and Amenirdis II, which puts him at the very end of 25th dynasty, just prior to Psalmatic I. And here again, I would mention the shape of the face, uh, particularly the, uh, the configuration of the eyes, I uh, and the wig. And I could go on. There's a statue in the Brooklyn Museum, also dated to the 25th dynasty, although it's connected to the estate of the God's wife, wives of Amun, but not, they're not specified. I don't want to repeat the characteristics again, but I just want to say that based on these uh, things, I have become convinced that our block statue head is 25th or even possibly early 26th dynasty. In case you, you still think it's Dynasty 18, I want to point out a few other things. And um, here, uh, again, the top of that cartouche. Uh, a cartouche on the chest like this does not occur on private statuary until late Dynasty 18. And by that, I would mean probably during the Amarna period or thereabouts. Certainly popular in Dynasty 20, but you do not get it in uh, earlier in Dynasty 18. This Metcher Newit formula, Newt formula is otherwise very commonly known, or the City God formula is most commonly known as the Sayite formula. It was published by Peel in the 1890s already as the Sayite formula, Sayite of course being Dynasty 26. And the reason he published it as the Sayite formula is that it's most common in, uh, in the late period. And while you do get examples in the 18th dynasty, they're mostly on Shuabtis, so it's exceedingly rare at that point. One other thing that I think is uh, potentially very interesting, this DS Jed may she give prosperity or rather stability. The DS suggests it's from the temple of a goddess. 
uh, not a god. And here there was a suggestion that the Boston block statue head was from the Moot Temple at Karnak. And I think that that suggestion is really valid. Certainly, there was other 25th Dynasty material found there. We have, of course, the, that, the statues of, of Mentuum Hat. And something that I find very appealing, the site was, of course, excavated by two women, Benson and Galway, between 1895 and 1897. Lady Mew, her collection was published in 1896. And I'm just imagining this ladies' luncheon at the <laughs> temple where little gifts are exchanged, and that one of those gifts was the Boston Block statue. <laughs> So um, obviously that is uh, speculation. I have to say exactly where in Dynasty 25 or possibly early Dynasty 26 block statue head belongs. I think it will have to await further research. You will, of course, note that we mentioned the Ra uh, in the cartouche here. Would that there were a few more signs because Ra is the first sign in the pronoun of every 25th Dynasty king. That won't do me any good. So in short, I hope that I have shown you some interesting objects. And all of these, again, were acquired by the MFA since 2011. I, a piece that I identify as the head of Amenemhat I, one of very, very few examples of sculpture of that king. A torso of the vizier Mentuhotep, Possibly the only non-royal person to have his head replaced and repaired in antiquity. We do have gods and other and royalty that have their heads replaced, but no, no other private individuals to my knowledge. And with our head of a block statue as a 25th dynasty head, we may perhaps have one of the great personalities who served those wonderful Kushite kings, of which I can't resist showing you a selection of the Taharka Shawabtis in Boston. Mostly, I hope I have demonstrated the rewards of critical observation and shown you that knowledge of the stylistic changes that are part and parcel of the study of Egyptian art history are valid. And I hope we continue to teach Egyptian art history as a discipline in its own right. Because if we don't, in my opinion at least, we cut ourselves off from a lot of really valuable information. So please come see the pieces. Thank you. <laughs>
budgetary resources for that, how, how you go about it. I mean, just give us a rough idea. <laughs> I, my colleagues from the Met are here too. I think we could have a long discussion about this. First of all, I think every museum is different. Museums are always having financial difficulties. Thank goodness Boston has funds that are dedicated to the purchase of objects and can only be used for the purchase of objects. Otherwise, they would have been used to keep the lights on a long time ago. It is a very lengthy process. In fact, it's never easy. The fun part, of course, is going out and finding something that's worthy of the collection, deciding first that it's real, and figuring out the date. The not so much fun is tracking down every single bit of the provenance information, leaving no end uh, unpursued. I've simplified it greatly. There are other people who can address provenance issues, and perhaps we could talk further at the reception, but let me uh, just say, after the provenance has been vetted and decided to be clean, I, well, even before that, a curator would take the piece to the director because if the director, no matter how much I might like it, if the director doesn't like it, we're not getting it. Uh, and then I would present it to uh, the trustee committee on collections. And the good news for me is that, um, that's it, a mixed bag. Uh, I was going to say the good news is that there are the, the trustees are tremendously supportive of the museum, but not particularly knowledgeable in antiquities, so that they don't um, they don't uh, they seldom challenge uh, the curator's decisions. Uh, uh, well, whereas we might like some more challenge, uh, and I'd love to hear how it is in the Met. But, uh, and once the, tr it is formally accession to the collection once the collections committee votes on it. There are very generous uh, patrons of museums over the years who have given endowed funds uh, to be used exclusively for purchase of objects. And these can be as broad as any objects or Renaissance or Greek coins and medals. And that's one fund that we have. And sometimes the difficulty is if these funds are too specifically, too narrowly defined, the difficulty is finding something that they can actually be used for. The funds that the directors like most are general funds. The funds that the curators like most are specific to the departments, <laughs> and even within that, specific to a, a field in the department, so ancient Near East versus Egyptian versus Greek or Roman. Uh, we never have enough funds. <laughs> And of course, as you know, uh, many more people besides scholars of antiquity and curators are interested in antiquities as decorative art objects, or, or I should say in a different way, are really recognizing the sculptural beauty and artistry of these pieces. And a number of dealers who might have handled old master sculptures or paintings are now buying antiquities, which makes it more complicated for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you.